this is the Provoke Prawn, and this is the Fractal Lumen S24. This is a 240mm all-in-one cooler that I'm using here in the Fractal Focus 2, which I've done a video on separately that I'll link to in the description. And in this video, I'm going to be setting up this cooler with an LGA1700 socket to show you the process for that. I'm going to unbox what's included in the box and show you the setup process for it and talk about the various things of interest along the way. Now, this is an RGB cooler, but without RGB fans. There is an RGB variant of it, which does have RGB fans, but for this setup, only the pump head has RGB that's controllable from the motherboard software. And you can see that from the box. So you can see from the box art here that we have RGB on the pump. We also have daisy chainable fans, which makes the process for setting up fairly straightforward with the exception of in the Focus 2 that I covered in the review of that case. Find out more about that in that dedicated video. Inside the box, you do get the two fans and all the other bits that you need. Now this small compact cooler, which has a stealthy look to it, as you'll see, is interesting for a number of reasons. And it will support LGA 1700 and a number of other sockets, including Intel 1200 socket. Uh, 1150 and the variants of that 2066 as well as amd's am4 am3 am2 fm2 plus and more it comes pre-applied with thermal paste and obviously is pre-filled with coolant as well to cool your setup so fairly straightforward setup and reasonably easy installation process one of the things that i found interesting about it is the setup of the pump that we see in a minute and the way the connections work. Now, at the end of this video, I'm going to do some benchmark testing. I'll also show you the RGB control for the pump head and what you can do with it there. But one of the things of note is the cap on top of the pump actually is turnable, so you can take off the lid and turn it around depending on how you're building it, which is pretty interesting. Now, when you look at the radiator, you'll notice there's a square in there. That is basically where the pump is located, rather than being in the block that sits on top of the CPU. Instead, you have it in the radiator, which is fairly unusual. And you have a cable coming out from that that you need to connect to the AIO pump header on your motherboard as a result. This is fairly unusual to see and interesting setup, fairly curious. I was quite intrigued by it because it means that you have extra cables to plug in because the fan cables are actually controlled separately and plugged in elsewhere. So you basically connect up two lots of connections up to different points on your motherboard, which can lead to some complexities depending on your case and the setup there and the much space you've got to work with and such. Now when you get everything out of the box, there's quite a lot of stuff going on here and it may look a bit intimidating, but obviously you have the things included necessary to build in a variety of socket motherboards. Now it's worth noting that if you don't have the necessary equipment for LGA 1700, you can get a bracket and adapter from Fractal by contacting them. So check out the website to get in touch with them about it. Now you'll find there's an Intel backplate and also the instructions for setting it up, as well as this one, which is an AMD attachment, which I'm not going to be using this build. I'm going to be focusing on LGA 1700 from Intel and showing the process for setting up there. Most of the Intel setups are very similar. You have long radiator screws. The screws go through the fans. You can also see there's an LGA 2011 standoff screws in a separate bag that's clearly marked. You also have this RGB cable. That cable plugs into the pump head and then into your motherboard. And there's a five volt connection. This gives you RGB control from your motherboard software. So in my case, I'm using a Zeus Armory Crate software. You basically plug that connection in there and then connect it up. The interesting point here is there's no SATA power connections from anything on the pump, which is fairly unusual. Usually you have a bit of SATA power to your power supply unit or you have a control box of some sort. But all of this is actually quite interestingly set up, quite different from other coolers I've tested out in the last few months. So curious that only one cable coming out of the pump though potentially makes things look a bit, a little bit neater, depending on where your RGB header is and how you manage to run that cable. So here's the kit. It doesn't actually look that bad until you start getting things out of the bad bags and then there's a lot more going on. But as I said, some of this isn't needed so we can get rid of the AMD attachments, for example, and obviously the 2011 socket standoffs we don't need those either so we can just ditch those things and move them out of the way you'll see the instructions for lj 1100 and 1200 socket motherboards and i've done a video separately on what to do and how to cope with lj 1700 
I'll link to in the description, which basically talks about the various setups for that. Essentially, there's a slightly different standoff setup for LGA 1700. And most manufacturers give you an aftermarket kit if you've not purchased a new cooler. So the new version of the cooler usually comes with the extra brackets. In this case, basically, you have to run the standoff screws through the back of the back plate, which is going to sit behind your motherboard. And I'll show you the process for that. And those screws go into a certain position. Basically, you need to make sure they fit through the holes on the motherboard in the right place. And because of the motherboard setup that I've got, which you'll see in a minute, which is a Strix motherboard, it actually has four holes and cut out in two places. So you actually have eight holes in slightly different places, which is basically means that you can use a 1200 socket bracket connection on it, which makes life a little bit easier. So you run these long screws through the bracket and then you put the little attachments on over the top of that that basically hold it slightly in place I'm doing this all outside the case just to give you a good view of how things work. We basically set that up uh, with all four of those ready to go on the back of the motherboard, which I'll show you the process for in a minute. Now I'm setting up the 240 mil cooler, getting an idea of where I'm going to mount it, thinking about how it's going to place in the case. In the case that I'm building in, you can only mount the 240 mil cooler on the roof, on the top of the case. So it's either tubes on the right or tubes on the left. I thought it'd be better to put tubes on the left because I'm not putting any fan on the rear of the case. So we're not going to have any fan at the rear. The air that is going through the case is then exhausting through the fans and out the top of the radiator. So making sure now that I'm working out the logic for that, I want the cables from the fans and from the radiator to face towards the back of the case. Quick point of note, if you look at the radiator, you'll also find that that cable that runs off of there, you can flick it in either direction. So you can actually run it one way or the other across the radiator length. I've got it facing down towards the bottom at the moment. I could face it up towards the top if you're putting it the other way around. So you have some flexibility in what you do there. Then you have the bag of long radiator screws and those obviously go into the fans. Now the fans need to be mounted this way. Basically they're facing towards me, towards the camera, but when I put it into the case, they'll be facing down towards the bottom of the case. Basically this sucks air up through the fans, through the radiator and then exhausts it out of the top of the case, cooling the radiator coolant down and helping to keep the CPU cool. I'm going to show you all the connections for what you do with the fan cables and such as we go through. But we obviously need to secure all those fan screws to make sure it's mounted properly and they're all connected up nicely and there's no rattle from them. Now the thing that's cool about these fans is that they are daisy chained so you can see out of each of the fans there's an extra attachment. Basically you can just connect one fan to the other and then that final connection then needs to go to the motherboard to give your motherboard control over the fan speed nice and straightforward and logical easy to do and this obviously means a little bit less hassle in terms of working out where to put your connections if you have the 360 mil version of this cooler obviously you could link up three fans so you can see here a close look at the motherboard you see what I was talking about multiple points on the motherboard here whereas notches have been cut out that will work with both 1200 and 1700 socket setups brackets and standoffs depending on what you've got. And I'm obviously going to use this that I've previously done earlier on in the video and slip it behind. Now you could do this as I'm doing it, or you could do it when it's put in the case, but just to make it easier for you to see what I'm doing, I'm doing it outside the case because it makes it a little bit more obvious what we're doing. So basically you're putting the back plate on and running those screws through to the front. These are the standoff screws that you're going to seat the pump over in a little while and you're basically positioning it in the right place. Now what I noticed is you have to sort of turn each of these standoffs inwards so the flat bit faces in in order to hold it into place. I also notice it's not a perfect hold, there's no sticky tape or any stickiness to the back of the back plate that will hold it in place. So if you are doing it the way I'm doing it, you may find that the back plate falls out until it's properly secured with the pump on top of it as well. So it can be a little bit more fiddly Whereas if you've got it mounted in the case and the case is standing up, then it will probably stay in place. Once you've done that, you then use these plastic washers that basically sit over the top. So the extra standoffs just basically hold the CPU cooler where it needs to go. And then we're going to position the radiator into the case so it's ready to go. Now, as a quick note, with this case, I actually had to use an additional bracket that's included with the case in order to mount this cooler to the top of the case. But this is a standard 240mm 
radiator so you should find it if you're using a different case for example that it will mount perfectly fine in any of the positions and you can see what i was talking about with the fact that the tubes are at the rear but one of the things that i noticed with this case is there's not a terrible amount of room once the radiator is in there to be able to deal with the cables that i'm going to need to plug in so for example i have two eight pin cpu power connectors that need to connect up to the motherboard and they would be very difficult to access once the radiator is mounted. So I'm basically going about plugging those in now. So I'd recommend testing the position of where your radiator is going to sit, working out how much room you're going to have for doing things like this, because there's nothing worse than getting everything seated in there and then having to push your hand through a tiny gap in order to manipulate cables into the right place. Learn from my mistakes or the tips that I'm giving you to make your life a little bit easier. And what you'll see is this then makes life a bit more straightforward and you can actually go about neatening the cables up and getting them out of the way too. The other thing I'd recommend is actually plugging in the other cables before you start mounting things as well. So as I said earlier, the cable from the pump, as in from the radiator, needs to be plugged into the all-in-one cooler pump head on your motherboard. The position of this may vary. You may find it in the top right-hand corner of the motherboard on this one is actually just below the CPU in the bottom left corner. So you can see me plugging it in here. The reason I'm doing this is because it's probably also going to become fiddly later on trying to plug that in once everything's mounted. But here you can see if I just do a close up zoom into it, it's that right header just down on the left corner of the case there. So you plug that in, that gives your motherboard control over the pump and it knows that there's an all in one cooler plugged into that which it can then connect up. We then have the two cables coming out of the daisy chain fans. There's actually only one single connection that you need to plug in. And I would recommend plugging that into the CPU fan header, which is at the top usually on your motherboard. You'll see there's actually two here, CPU fan and CPU optional. I actually use the optional originally, and then I discovered that if you do that, your fans will spin up maximum speed constantly, which can make it a bit too loud and not ideal. So make sure you use the CPU fan and then you can adjust the speeds within your motherboard software and in the BIOS. Then you just need to mount the radiator into the case to secure things and make sure it's all stable and in place before you go about the next process, which is obviously seating the head down onto the CPU because that will then give you the connection to cool your CPU down when it's running a bit toasty. There's multiple small screws included in the box which you then screw into the various different holes on the radiator on top and lining them up with the case. Again, as I said, this case required an additional bracket in order to fit this, but a standard you usually find there's multiple holes on there. You just need to line up and use all the little screws to secure it nicely. I usually recommend securing them quite loosely to start with and then making sure that the radiator is where you want it to be before you finish. Now, as I said, you have the option of maneuvering this pump head around in different ways and you can pop the top off to then relocate the logo so it looks in the way you want it to. So if I'd mounted the radiator the other way around, for example, I wouldn't need to do this. You, you have the option to position it into different places. And so you can see that I've just done that. And also I need to remember the RGB connection. And that's one of the ones that I actually forgot because the RGB header on this motherboard is just behind the radiator now and that actually makes it quite fiddly to do as you'll see in a second i actually struggle to get that in but there is another option and that is on the bottom left of this motherboard so you may find there's multiple five volt rgb connections so because it has pre-applied thermal paste on it you just need to seat that down on top of the cpu and then carefully use each of the thumb screws so there's four thumb screws that need to be screwed down ever so gently but securely so that they're all in place and it's holding it down reasonably tight but not over tightened. This can be quite difficult to find a sweet spot for that. But if you don't tighten them up enough, you may find that your CPU runs really hot. And if you tighten them up too much, you could potentially damage the motherboard. So basically just, I wouldn't use a screwdriver for it. Just use your hand pressure and you should find the sweet spot for that. And then I'll show you how to test it later on. So now we have the RGB connection, as I said which unfortunately is buried behind the radiator now. So again, learn from my mistakes and do this first. Plug this in before you set up. It's much easier to plug one end into the head that sits on top of the CPU than it is to fiddle around trying to plug this into the RGB header. So do that end first and then work your way back to the top. You can see here 
the RGB headers on this motherboard. So they're in the top right, the white ones. And the one we're looking for is the one marked Gen 2 5 volt, so plus 5. That has three pins on it. And this basically gives RGB control for your motherboard software. So there's no dedicated software for this cooler, at least not this version of it anyway. You have to control it from your motherboard, which gives you various different options depending on your motherboard software. And you will have seen some of the RGB lighting a minute ago, and I'll show you a bit more later on. And you need to make sure you're running that software in order to control it. But it does mean that you can potentially sync it up with other things. You'll notice there's a little panel on the left side of the motherboard, for example, that in a minute I'll show you also has RGB lighting. So now we're finished and it's ready to go and we can turn the machine on. And you'll notice initially there's no RGB lighting on there. And that's because it, I hadn't quite plugged the RGB cable in correctly. But you may also find that if you're not in Windows and the software is not running, you may also find there's no RGB lighting it up or it will go on to a rainbow default setting. So if you find there's no RGB there, you may need to check that cable, make sure it's secured properly. And I then went about fixing that and now you can see what the RGB is like. So there's six LEDs in there giving you some RGB goodness and you can change between various settings depending on what your motherboard's capable of and sync it up. But you can see the glow from the cooler and from the motherboard is kind of matching up at the moment and it looks pretty swish i actually like the finish on this one it's quite nice and obviously if you don't want the rgb you could just not plug the rgb cable in and it will still work just fine so you now can see from this close-up look that you can cycle through different rgb lighting effects as standard it defaults to rainbow as it would with any other software and then you have various different glows of different colors as it cycles through them but you can obviously change these in the relevant motherboard software and it will work with a lot of different motherboard softwares and that's all listed in the description along with all the other specs if you want to find out more but there's not much point in me showing you the Zeus software because it will vary depending on your motherboard but you can see some of the nice glows and the way it lights up in the various different LEDs from there also I think that semi-opaque housing is kind of nice vibe to it especially when it matches up with some of the other RGB in the case if you had also some RGB fans and other things it might look even better as well and so the setup there is pretty good now a few notes I have found that uh, as I mentioned already, if the fans are spinning at maximum speed, it's quite loud. I also noticed there's a little bit of pump noise from this one, a tiny bit of a whine, but I think it's going to vary depending on your case and your overall setup. There aren't a great deal of fans in here, but it does get a little bit noisy. In a second, I'm just going to show you some benchmarks that I ran to show you a performance test as well. So once everything's set up and running nicely, I ran Cinebench R23 on several passes, uh, along with obviously also recording with OBS to capture this footage and hardware monitor which you can see on the right hand side. I also did some tests with Heaven Benchmark running at the same time to test out the performance of the case because I just wanted to see how the setup was there. But for this recording and for the purposes of this test I'm just running Cinebench which is pretty intense testing purposes and this is on the intel core i7 12700k in this setup and you can see the overall performance so this is from the end of the past this is it's just finishing up and we're maxing out about 81 degrees c which is actually really cool now considering i only have two 140 mil front fans mounted on here and then two 120 mil on the radiator and nothing else that's pretty good performance obviously you need to take benchmarks with a pinch of salt because it's going to vary from case to case and depending on your environmental temperatures so the temperature of your room and where the case is sitting and other things that's going to have an impact on it but actually this is really good for a 12th gen cpu setup and for this and so it's done a really good job there and just be sure to make sure that you go into your motherboard software and play around with the fan settings and the fan curve in there and get it working as you want but even on the basic default settings, this is the sort of performance that you can look at. This has been the Provoke Pro, and I hope you found this video useful. Let me know in the comments if you've got any questions. Hit that subscribe button if you've enjoyed this or found it useful in any way. And a big shout out to my YouTube members who help support the channel, and they are greatly appreciated. Thanks very much for watching. Have a great life.
This has been the Provoke Prawn. Hope you found this video useful, interesting, hilarious, or otherwise. Take a look at these other videos that I think you might find interesting as well. And have a look at the description for links and other information you might find useful. Click that join button to see the benefits of being a member of my YouTube channel. And most importantly, have a great life.